look here, your hair is still miniaturizing. Finance rate is not working with you. I hit rock bottom, you know. In my mind, I wasn't thinking you may have something else. There is another maybe kind of loss that is taking place. So I was five seconds away from an answer for 10 years and it was clear to her and it wasn't clear to them. Did they know and not told me? It's something that I keep asking myself. Imagine getting diagnosed with pattern hair loss, hopping on finasteride, hopping on minoxidil, but over the next decade, your hair loss just gets worse. Imagine paying thousands of dollars for a hair transplant, only for one year later, that transplant to start thinning. This is the story of Alessandro. He's a member of our community with a 10-year history of treatment failures prior to joining our site. Today, He's finally seeing regrowth. And in this video, we're going to detail exactly how he got there. Here's what I find crazy. Alessandro was diagnosed with androgenic alopecia on five separate occasions by five different physicians, including a transplant surgeon. The diagnosis was wrong. His story is as much a cautionary tale as it is a reflection of the underwhelming care that too many dermatologists provide to hair loss patients. I hope you can use the takeaways from this interview so that you never have to go through the same experience. We'll cover Alessandro's story and the data-driven approach that we applied while working with him. You'll learn about his treatment mistakes, his successes, the strategies for tackling androgenic alopecia you might be interested in, strategies for autoimmune hair loss disorders, and most importantly, how to dominate your next dermatology appointment and force your clinician to give you a proper scalp exam and a clear diagnosis. We even have a video and a PDF for that, which you can download below. But for now, let's get into Alessandro's story as told by him, and we'll make this as educational and impactful as possible. My hair loss started when I was really, really young. So I was like, not even 14. I was a child. I went to the barber and he told me, he was a friend of my father's, and he told me, I see some, I wouldn't say bold spots, but you know, some lack of density here on the top of my, of my scalp. My type of hair loss was, I, I started like to have a receding hairline, basically to lose some density in the, in, the, in the center. So from here backwards, yeah, that was terrifying. I was like in high school, so it was really, really, you know, tough for me as a, as a kid. And so he told my father, he told me, and I was like quite shocked. We, we met uh, this dermatologist and he told me, I mean, yeah, you suffer from alopecia, like your father, it's genetic. There's nothing you can do. After a year or two years, my situation was getting worse, slowly, but surely worse. So that's when we swapped doctor, we changed uh, the doctor. Another dermatologist told me, maybe you should give minoxidil a try. So I went to a pharmacy here in Italy. I don't know if in the US as well, but we have pharmacies that prepare the minoxidil themselves. So I went for, for it and uh, I started doing this, let's say, therapy. So uh, two milliliters uh, twice a day. For those who don't know, topical minoxidil is a drug used to treat pattern hair loss, also known as androgenic alopecia. It helps improve microcirculation. It might reduce inflammatory substances called prostaglandins. And clinical studies show a strong enough safety profile for the FDA to approve minoxidil as an over-the-counter medication for androgenic alopecia. Now, safe is one thing. Effective is another. We're going to get to that in a second. But for now, just know that many pattern hair loss patients who are younger than 18, they'll generally only be recommended minoxidil, partly because it might help, but also because some of the more powerful drugs used to treat pattern hair loss, things like finasteride, they can pose developmental risks for those who are still in adolescence. So how did Alessandro's experience with minoxidil go? I quit minoxidil. After one year, when I was 15, 16, I quit minoxidil. Nothing really worked, but I kept applying it blindly, I'd say I was really young, so I didn't even know really what to do and how to do it. This isn't surprising. Despite being FDA approved, Alessandro's poor experience with minoxidil is not the exception. It's the rule. In this clinical study, researchers found that 95% of minoxidil users quit within one year. And two thirds of those users said that they stopped because the drug had no effect. So is there any truth to corroborate that? Well, yes, a, a deeper look into the clinical data shows that topical minoxidil 
actually only works for about 40 to 60% of people. The reason why is twofold. First, Topical minoxidil has a hard time penetrating into deeper layers of the scalp skin where our hair follicles reside. And second, topical minoxidil is delivered inactively. It needs to come into contact with an enzyme called sulfotransferase in order to sulfate or activate, and then it can attach to our hair follicles and have an effect. No sulfotransferase, no way for minoxidil to work, and a lot of people don't have enough activity of this enzyme in their scalp for minoxidil to get the job done. Fortunately, studies also show that these are fixable problems. If you combine topical minoxidil with retinoic acid and microneedling, you can enhance its penetration and its activation, potentially seeing up to fourfold better results. It's that simple. And if clinicians did a better job educating patients about these options, my guess is that a lot more people would be sticking with minoxidil, a lot fewer people would be saying it doesn't work. Alessandro did not have that information. So let's see where he goes next. When I was like 17, 18, I talked to the doctor again, to the first dermatologist, and he told me, now you're old enough to try the finasteride. And I was, I, would, I wouldn't say I was desperate. I said, yeah, yeah, let's, let's try it. I mean, it's, you're a doctor, you're telling me this. And it's, I, I guess, one of the best or most uh, famous treatments for hair loss. So I said, yeah, why not? And he, he told me, ah, oh, you're going to improve a lot with this. You're going to like, everything will be fine. Everything is going to be all right. So I, I was super happy. That was almost 11 years ago. This makes sense. Alessandro is now 18 years old. He's eligible for 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like oral finasteride. These medications, they lower levels of dihydrotestosterone, also known as DHT, which is the hormone causally linked to the balding process. And in doing so, they can help regrow hair. For what it's worth, finasteride is considered the gold standard drug for treating androgenic alopecia in men. Dozens of studies show good hair growth outcomes, decent safety profiles, and sustained hair regrowth one, two, five, even 10 years into the future. This all sounds great. So what happened when Alessandro started taking finasteride? What was his response like? So I started to, 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 do with the, to take the finasteride. And I was, I was taking, if I remember correctly, one milligram. So I did this for a few years and my hair loss was slow. Year by year, I couldn't tell if I was getting really, really worse or not. So I thought maybe it's working, maybe it's not. Obviously I didn't gain like new hair. I'm not improving, but I'm not even like getting worse. So I was really confused, you know. Here's another thing most clinicians will not educate their patients on, how long it takes for hair growth drugs to actually work. For finasteride, the clinical studies show that it can take six to 10 months just to see slight cosmetic improvements. But the biggest hair gains, those actually come between months 12 and months 24. All too often, our team sees people quitting finasteride at month three, month four, saying they tried it, and it didn't work. They have no idea that it takes a full two years to achieve its effects. And if clinicians let people know about this while prescribing, I think a lot more of their patients would have better adherence and thereby better outcomes. Another thing is that most clinicians don't tell their patients what it means to respond to finasteride. Some patients envision full hair regrowth. In reality, response means something different. It means any slowing, stopping, or partial reversal of hair loss versus a placebo. Technically, you can still be benefiting from finasteride, but still losing hair, just at a slower rate than how you would if you weren't using the medication. We talk about this in our video series about finasteride non-responders. So keep this in mind, a slowing of hair loss is still technically a response. Now let's go back to Alessandro and what he decided to do next. When I was 23, 24, I said, okay, that's enough. Uh, nothing wor is working with me. The only solution I thought was the hair transplant. So I started looking for surgeons and I found a top one, a really famous one, which is in Turkey. Uh, not to be confused with those guys that, you know, they, they sell you hair transplants for $2,000. It's not one of them. He's a great guy and he's like really, really famous. So I went to talk to him in Turkey and he told me, yeah, what we have to do here is do 5,000 5, grafts, which is the maximum they can take from the side and the back of your head and put it in the top. 
So he said, let's not lower the hairline. Let's stay there and let's work away from here to the back. So my, my hair transplant reached, let's say, here. So I didn't touch the vertex. The vertex wasn't involved. He told me, you, can, you could be a great patient. Uh, your transplant is going to turn uh, really great. Uh, let's do it. So I did it. I was 24. So six years ago, the clinic was awesome. Uh, I was treated like a king. Everything went well. Uh, the day of the operation, the surgery, after the surgery, they told me, your grafts, so the hair they plucked from the sides and the back, survived really good. They were healthy. Everything went well. Uh, so I went back home. I waited a few months, obviously. I wasn't you sleeping at night, you know? I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna have new hair. It's gonna be awesome. And I must say the hair transplant worked really well. The hairline was great, was so natural. The results were, was amazing to me. So I was really happy. Um, they told me one year before the transplant, they told me, keep, keep taking finasteride. Don't, don't quit the finasteride because the finasteride will help you also after the transplant. So that's what I did. I kept taking finasteride. Uh, what's funny is that when I went to the clinic to meet the surgeon, he put, he, he put my scalp under a microscope and he told me, look here. And he, he pointed at my hair. You're still, your hair is still miniaturizing. So finasteride is not working with you. And I was like, I was struck. I was like, what? I mean, crazy. And he told me, yeah, but you know, maybe, maybe it's because the, you're taking the one prepared by the pharmacy. So maybe it's not that strong. Uh, use the Prosker, which is a famous one you can find anywhere. So I, yeah, I said, yeah, maybe, maybe it's, uh, that's why, maybe that's why. For reference, there are a number of dosing studies on finasteride with participants testing anywhere from 0.2 milligrams up to five milligrams daily for regrowth. These doses, they all roughly reduce the same amount of serum and scalp DHT. However, most of the studies still show directionally better results for people on higher doses of finasteride. Alessandra was prescribed one milligram daily. Proscar is the five milligram version of finasteride. So I understand why his surgeon made this recommendation. There's a little upside with a higher dose. However, the key word here is little. The increased hair gains going from one to five milligrams of finasteride, it's very marginal, which means this is a low leverage recommendation with a not so big payout. What would have been more impactful? Well, perhaps maybe switching from finasteride to dutasteride, as dutasteride can reduce more DHT and lead to significantly better hair growth outcomes versus finasteride. And yet dutasteride in many domains will share a similar safety profile. So if you find yourself in this situation, keep in mind that there are higher leverage regrowth options at your disposal. Now, back to Alessandro. So after one year of the transplant, my results were complete. Let's say I was happy, I was still taking uh, finasteride. But at that point I said, okay, now I have like a good situation, I'm happy. I don't wanna take finasteride anymore. I don't wanna be on drugs. Uh, I don't wanna be taking any, any, any medication, any drug. So I made a huge mistake, I guess, maybe. I quit to a cold turkey only after a few months. So after a year and six months after my transplant, I started to see some loss of density in my, in my scalp. So I panicked and I said, oh my God, it's not possible. It's not possible that my situation is getting worse again just after a year and a few months after my transplant. So that was really, really when I hit a really rock bottom, you know? It was like, mentally was super tough because I had the impression, the idea that I, I was able to overcome my problem and after just one year and a, and a half, I was back at, uh, I wouldn't say square one because I still kept some hair, but it was noticeable. For people in Alessandro's position, this sentiment is incredibly common. A transplant can dramatically boost the appearance of your hair to the point where you can feel so good, so confident that you forget that hair loss in the surrounding areas can still progress. If you want to protect that investment, that hair transplant, you generally need to make sure that your hair loss is completely stabilized. And the most studied and reliable way to do this for men is with finasteride. So what happens when somebody quits that drug? Well, Here's a chart showing that within three months, hair shedding starts to increase. And within 12 months, 
you're usually back to where you would have been prior to using the drug in the first place. The bottom line, you should be aware of these risks, be aware of the withdrawal effects, even if you're feeling good about your hair. That was really, really when I hit a really rock bottom, you know? It was like, mentally was super tough because I had the impression, the idea that I, I was able to overcome my problem and after just one year and a, and a half, I was back at, uh, I wouldn't say square one, because I still kept some hair and uh, it wasn't like day by day, but it was noticeable, let's say. That's when I talked to the surgeon again and he told me, yeah, you quit finasteride, you shouldn't have. Let's, I want you to go back on finasteride and let's see what happened. So a few, a few more uh, months have passed and then the pandemic hit and was really tough. Yeah, what happened was I, I didn't have any solution at that point. I was stuck. This is not unfamiliar territory for hair loss sufferers. When people experience setbacks, when they experience treatment failures, desperation can set in. It's as if every hair growth ad starts to find you and you fall into this habit of maybe buying pills, topical supplements, shampoos, devices, without any trial and error process in place and without knowing if these marketing claims that you're seeing even align with scientific reality. Most of the time they don't. And in researching one product Alessandro had bought, that's actually how he stumbled across our site. So one day uh, I was reading an article uh, on reishi mushroom because I was always looking for, you know, new information or uh, some something new. I just bought a 40, 40 euro uh, lotion from a, you know, a really well-known brand where some reishi mushroom was in it. When I started reading the article, I was so, so angry, man, because I thought maybe this reishi mushroom is, can, can, you know, can work. It's a solution. But then I, and I, I was mad at the, at the guy who wrote the article because I said, ah, this guy is lying. No, it's working. It will work for me. And, but in the end, I must admit the article was really, really well done. And I started to say, who's this guy? I mean, who's this website? And it's, it's so interesting. I reached out. It was obviously it was your, your website, your community. I reached out and uh, just after a few days, I, I read all the literature on the website. I read all the, you know, all the guides you, you wrote. And I was super hopeful. I said, this guy is going to help me. I know we can find a solution together. I know we can work together. And uh, yeah, that's, that's when we, we met the first time. Alessandro ended up joining our membership community. This is where we offer educational resources and personal support for people fighting hair loss. Prior to joining, most members find themselves in a position where they're not seeing success, they're tired of burning cash, they're over the marketing gimmicks, and they're ready to have a clear path forward, one that will respect their treatment preferences and also come with support from people who only care about getting them a good outcome, not selling them into some hair care brand because they affiliate with them. Alessandro had also opted for our coaching package, which means that he and I would have the chance to connect every week during a one to two hour group call. I like this format because it creates multiple touch points. It helps with accountability and those things for people who have complicated cases really help to go for the best outcomes. On our first call together, Alessandro detailed all of his treatment attempts, all of his failures, the transplant, everything. And then after getting that information, we began to implement a framework that we use with everybody inside of our site. One, identify your hair loss types. Two, align on goals. Three, build a regimen. Four, track for results. And five, adjust accordingly based on data, not emotion. So let's apply this framework using what we know about Alessandro so far. First, he's got a familial history of androgenic alopecia. He also described hair loss in regions associated with androgenic alopecia, the temples and the frontal forelock of his scalp. He says his hair loss has been gradual over a series of years, and he's had four or five dermatologists and a transplant surgeon all align on the same diagnosis. Androgenic alopecia, nothing else. This makes for a very strong case that Alessandro is dealing with androgenic alopecia. So we'll call that step closed for now. Second, Alessandro let us know that he wanted new hair growth, but he also was getting side effects from oral finasteride and he wanted to find a way to quit the medication. This allowed us to define clear goals. First, get Alessandro hair regrowth 
And second, eliminate his side effects from finasteride. For step three, we have to take into account Alessandro's treatment history. He didn't see hair regrowth from finasteride. However, he noticed a big shed when he quit the drug. That suggests that maybe finasteride was working, he just fell into that category where it was slowing things down, not necessarily reversing the loss. Moreover, Alessandro quit topical minoxidil after one year, but he didn't know about all these adjuvant therapies, the retinoic acid, the microneedling, that might have helped him turn into a responder. Given the alignments of his diagnosis, the past treatment attempts, the strong data supporting the things that we just talked about in helping androgenic alopecia patients, we decided to show him this data. And we also showed Alessandro the results horizons for these treatments. That's the time that it would take for them to start producing cosmetic results. After reflecting on all of this, Alessandro settled on the following plan. Topical finasteride, which some studies show should allow him to leverage the power of oral finasteride, but with a lower risk of side effects. 5% minoxidil combined with retinoic acid. And finally, microneedling, which along with the retinoic acid should help to enhance the effects of minoxidil. Alessandro also opted to try some other stimulation-based interventions like the scalp massages because he felt that his scalp perimeter muscles appeared to be really tight and he found the exercise to be very relaxing. So this was his new plan. Alessandro intended to try these things for at least four to six months, which is the short end of when we might expect cosmetic improvements. And he also chose to track his progress through self-assessments and subjective measurements of his own hair shedding. Now those metrics, they're certainly not perfect. Usually we want people to be tracking with our progress logs tool where you upload your regimen, your photos, you tag the dates, you tag the scalp regions of the photos, and then this auto sorts to give you a fully private, fully standardized log that is super easy to navigate, super easy to update, and examine your progress in any specific scalp region. And if you choose, you can also share that log with our community so our team and others can provide feedback and support. But for people who have been fighting hair loss for a long time, they often have the self-awareness to know if something is or isn't working. Alessandro had that, and so these measurement tools that he settled on were gonna be what worked for him. Personally, I had high hopes for Alessandro's protocol. I mean, the clinical data strongly suggests that this new regimen, if followed properly, should achieve some significant results. And while adherence can be a problem for some people, which is why we built our treatments calendar, which sends you push reminders via your phone for when you need to microneedle or apply topicals or use a shampoo with ketoconazole, any of that, Alessandro happened to be a person who was highly motivated. And as our group calls continued, it became more and more apparent that he just had no issues on the adherence front. So fast forward a few months, Alessandro's adhering to the plan, he's showing up to the calls, he's engaging our team, he's even reported that his side effects from finasteride have subsided. This is great news. One of our goals is already accomplished. But how is his hair doing? I was spending like quite some time, you know, every day uh, working on my scalp. I did everything I could and uh, I made sure I did it correctly. So I was like asking you thousand questions to make sure I was using the microneedling. I bought a pen. So it was like also an economic, you know, um, investment. I was doing all these things and I was applying the, uh, at this point I switched from oral to topical finasteride. I was applying it after, after the minoxidil every night and it was leaving my hair horrible in the morning. And after a, a few, a few months, I was hoping that the massages would be working in a way, but I didn't see any growth. The microneedling as well wasn't even, you know, I, I wasn't getting the results other people were getting. This was hard to hear. Despite the new protocol, Alessandro had seen effectively no changes to his rate of hair fall, no changes in the progression of his hair loss, no signals that what he was doing was doing anything. Now, keep in mind that while that experience feels discouraging, we have to remember our fifth pillar, using data to make adjustments. Responding to these treatments would have been wonderful, but not responding to them, that's still great data because that data, even if it's negative, helps to provide insights that we can start to use to troubleshoot, maybe ask better questions and adjusting the plan. So what might be going on here? Well, possibility number one is that maybe Alessandro needs more time for results. 
After all, we've only just reached that minimum viable point for results horizons. Especially with finasteride, the best results aren't even realized until year two of the medication. Now, in fairness to Alessandro, he had been using finasteride on and off for the better part of a decade. So while this was still a possibility, it might not necessarily be a plausibility. Even still, this is an easy thing to test. All Alessandro needs to do is just keep trying his treatment protocol and we can evaluate in the coming months. Possibility number two is that something else is going on. Either Alessandro has something preventing him from seeing hair regrowth from androgenic alopecia treatments, or he might have another type of hair loss that needs to be treated differently, preventing him from getting results. So let's start with that first category, these blockers to hair regrowth from androgenic alopecia. According to the clinical data, people with IGF-1 or growth hormone deficiencies, they tend to see really poor responses to hair growth drugs like minoxidil and finasteride. Again, this is easy enough to test. Just get a serum test for IGF-1. If it's low, medical professionals can help you identify why that's low, and in many cases get you treatment and get those levels back to optimal. Moreover, many of our members who consider themselves non-responders to finasteride will later do blood tests for DHT, and a huge portion of them have found that their serum DHT levels, they're not depressed. They're actually within normal to high ranges. The implication here is that for these members, maybe those DHT reducing drugs might not be having much of a DHT reducing effect. Again, this is easy to test for. Just get a serum DHT test. If it's low, great. If it's normal or high, consider upping your dose of finasteride, switching to dutasteride, switching to topical dutasteride. These things have helped many of the members in this category move from that non-responder to responder class for 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So on this front, what were the results for Alessandro? Well, he got blood work. His IGF-1 levels looked totally normal. Great, that's another piece of data. So what about his serum DHT levels? Well, Alessandro had actually gotten a number of DHT tests while still taking oral finasteride. And oral finasteride at one milligram to five milligrams is supposed to reduce blood levels of DHT by about 70%. He told us his results. His DHT was always in the normal range. Sometimes it was even high. Unfortunately, Alessandro was a bit stuck on what he could do about this because Keep in mind that he already got side effects from oral finasteride, which is why he made the switch to the topical. If he ups his topical dose, more of that drug might leak into the bloodstream and start causing the same side effects as the oral medication. Now he could try to lower his scalp DHT through other means, like androgen receptor antagonists. This might include experimental options. You might have heard of some of these. Topical spironolactone, topical floridil, topical CB0301, RU58841, topical pyrolutamide, and others. But all of these options, they lack long-term safety and efficacy data on men. So understandably, Alessandro wasn't really interested at this stage in exploring them. So what about the possibility of other hair loss types maybe masking as androgenic alopecia or preventing a response from Alessandro's current treatments? Well, we have some tools to evaluate this. Here you can evaluate your health history and then cross-reference any unusual symptoms you have with conditions that are linked to hair shedding disorders such as telogen effluvium. Then you can go about systematically tackling each of those suspected causes. So say you've got a thyroid disorder or a vitamin deficiency or anything. If it's having an impact on your hair, then if you address those causes, it should also help to improve your hair. For anyone interested in help on this, we have a regrowth roadmap health assessment survey inside of our site that can help you out with that process. But Alessandro did lab testing here too, based on his symptoms. And the results didn't really tell us too much. We checked my testosterone levels, the either testosterone levels. So we, we, I did plenty of exams. I did really everything. And uh, I would say results came back pretty normal except my bilirubin. So as you said before, maybe um, I had elevated uh, bilirubin, which is correlated to uh, the Gilbert syndrome, which is just a condition. I, I, it doesn't have any impact on, on your life, but it gives me some uh, yellowishness, let's say in my, in my eyes. But as you, as you rightly said before, always thinking about the let's say standard androgenic alopecia, not, not, you know, not outside of those, of that, of that box. The good news was that Alessandro's lab tests helped him rule out some of the potential secondary causes of hair loss. 
The bad news was that it didn't definitively answer why he remained such a poor responder to such a strong hair growth stack. And as another month or two passed, he started to go deeper into those results horizon windows, yet his situation was not changing. No slowing down of hair loss, no decrease in hair shedding, nothing at all. Could something else be going on? Given all the data so far, we felt it was important to start operating under the assumption that the answer might be yes. So we started to revisit one of the big initial assumptions about Alessandro, that he was actually dealing with androgenic alopecia. And I know that that sounds crazy to consider given that he has a family history, his patterning of loss, the five medical professionals on five separate occasions converging on the same exact diagnosis and nothing else. Even still, there were some oddities around Alessandro's case. For instance, Alessandro had some mild symptoms associated with autoimmunity. We won't list them here, but if somebody has an autoimmune condition, their likelihood of having a second autoimmune condition increases. Keep in mind that there are some autoimmune conditions that cause hair loss, and that these conditions, they have different causes than androgenic alopecia, so they require different treatments. Secondly, when we asked Alessandro to describe the hairs that he was shedding while combing through his hair or taking a shower, he'd routinely mention that all of the hairs that fell out were the exact same hair diameter. He never noticed a mixture of thin hairs and thick hairs. Now, this isn't unheard of, but for men with androgenic alopecia, you would typically expect a mixture of both thick hairs and thin hairs to shed, as this indicates the presence of hair follicle miniaturization, which is a defining characteristic of male pattern hair loss. Yet, Alessandro wasn't experiencing this, even over months and months of tracking his hair fall. So let's do a quick recap. Alessandro isn't seeing a robust response to FDA-approved hair loss drugs. He has symptoms of autoimmunity unrelated to his hair. His hair shedding is uniform in diameter. His hair transplant continues to thin, and that started within a year after his surgery. These are all signals that perhaps this androgenic alopecia diagnosis is maybe wrong, maybe it's incomplete. In my mind, uh, I wasn't thinking like, you, you may have something else. There is another maybe kind of loss that is staying in place. There is something autoimmune. I didn't think about it. I mean, I was so focused on, you know, trying all these approaches that I was thinking one will work and, or maybe it will take more time, but something will move the needle. But nothing, nothing really did. I, I was really starting to, you know, to lose hope and to think that maybe it's just the way I am, you know? So it was, yeah, as I said, it was really, really tough mentally. So if we lean into the framework that we outlined and we start reassessing all of this data, what are the possibilities? Well, in all of our calls together, Alessandro indicated that he had no history of scalp pain, scalp redness, significant scalp discomfort, or massive bouts of hair shedding following scalp pain. This indicated that a scarring alopecia masking as androgenic alopecia, something like diffuse lichen planopillaris, was probably less likely. That's because these hair loss types are often, but not always, accompanied by bouts of scalp pain and bouts of hair shedding. That left us with another possibility, diffuse alopecia areata or alopecia areata incognita. This is a type of hair loss that can look, in some cases, exactly like androgenic alopecia. It can even present alongside androgenic alopecia, but it comes from completely different sets of causes and thereby requires completely different sets of treatments. Some studies also report that shedding in alopecia areata, it can be uniform and present without hair diameter diversity. That sort of sounds like Alessandra, which means that this might be a reasonable hypothesis worth exploring. So we brought all of this data up to Alessandra. We sent him our guides on alopecia areata that feature photos of people with alopecia areata incognita. We also asked him to find a dermatologist specializing in this type of hair loss and in his location, preferably one connected to a university and who publishes research. This was a big ask for Alessandro and he didn't necessarily know where to start. I mean, he was based in Italy and he'd already seen a lot of dermatologists in his area and was understandably disenfranchised with the level of care that they were giving him. But by complete chance, another member of ours, Carlo, also happened to be from Italy. Carlo had seen significant hair recovery from a rare hair loss disorder known as lichen planopillaris. And he happened to be very familiar 
with the university-based dermatologists in Alessandro's area. He told me, why don't you talk to Carlo? I think, I think he really, like his, his, um, his uh, profile uh, overlaps with yours and, and you, can, you can talk to him, like talk to him. I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll talk to him. So I connected with Carlo, uh, which is uh, a fellow Italian, and uh, we, we talked a lot and he was uh, so, so kind. And he, he told me, I'm, I'm living here in Italy, in Rome right now, and he, he's living there in, in California, I guess. And he told me, there is a guy, there is a doctor, which is a really good one, and he lives in Rome. He, he visits patients in Rome. And that was uh, quite a coincidence, right? And he told me, why don't you call this doctor and, and, uh, and talk to him? Through Carlo, Alessandro was able to connect with somebody called Dr. Alfredo Rossi. He is a world-renowned clinician, a professor at the University of Rome, a co-author of over 80 peer-reviewed papers, and a specialist in the identification and treatment of rare hair loss disorders. And this doctor showed some really, you know, good insights, some good ideas on how to tackle his kind of hair loss, let's say, uh, autoimmune hair loss, with an approach that, was, that wasn't really used by someone else. So it was like a trailblazer in a way, right? So ones that, you know, open new roads. And I was really interested in this guy. So I talked to him and uh, he also knew your, your website. When I talked to the guy, uh, I called the, the, to, to book an appointment with him. And the, the assistant told me he's not available for five months. When I, when I went on to Google to search for this guy, I, I suddenly I, I, I realized he was super famous here in Italy. And uh, he was all only in, in those blogs that talk about hair loss, he was everywhere. It took months to get an appointment. And when Alessandro finally did, he walked into the clinic, he met with one of Dr. Rossi's staff members. And this is where the story gets crazy. Just listen to what Alessandro says. So I waited. And uh, firstly, I took an appointment with his, let's say, his keep. He wasn't there. I talked to another person, but they assured me it was like the same. So I went there, I sat down, she saw me and she said, yeah, let's, let's take a look. So she took like a magnifier, or I don't know what to call it, a microscope. I, she put my, my, my scalp under and after a few seconds, she took some pictures and she said, you have alopecia, I mean, you, you have androgenic alopecia, but you also have alopecia areata incognita. And I was, what? I mean, really, what, what's that? For those who are wondering, alopecia areata is an autoimmune disorder. It's where your hair follicles lose immune privilege and the body starts to attack them. The estimated risk of developing alopecia areata is about 2% over your lifetime. So it's rarer, but it's common enough that clinicians and dermatologists see it on a regular basis. It usually presents in patches like this or like this, but not always. It can also present diffusely and evenly across somebody's scalp. And when this happens, it's particularly harder to diagnose, especially in cases where androgenic alopecia is also present. Even still, a good dermatologist should be able to make what's called a differential diagnosis. Why? Because there are very clear markers for a differential diagnosis that all dermatologists should know about. So she said, oh, look, look here, you, you can see some small, really, really tiny white hair. That's some indication of alopecia area and cognita. And she also said something that I, I kept thinking about. She said, you have some empty follicles. And the standard, let's say, traditional andro androgenic alopecia doesn't get you there. So it's when with, with alopecia, and you, 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 you can tell it far better than I, I'm doing it right now, but with alopecia, androgenic alopecia, you have a smaller hair every cycle, let's say, in a rough way. You don't have uh, empty, fo empty follicles. That's what she told me. I don't know if that's correct, but she said, that's why I could, I could you know, tell you it's alopecia red and right away. It was so evident to me. This is important. Both androgenic alopecia and diffuse alopecia areata can present with hair follicle miniaturization. The patterning of loss, even the disease progression can look very similar. But with diffuse alopecia areata or alopecia areata incognita, you'll also often see yellow dots surrounding the follicles. 
You can see the presence of white unpigmented hairs. You might see dystrophic or exclamation mark hairs while shedding. And if a clinician doesn't know how to look for these things, they cannot make that differential diagnosis. Yeah, that was that was really interesting, you know. After all these years, it was so easy for her to diagnose this. And it was obviously was quite shocking to me. It didn't, you know, take, I don't know, months or multiple exams to get there. It was obvious to her and also to the to the doctor who visited me like a few months after. This is what blows my mind. Apparently, five doctors, along with a transplant surgeon, didn't know how to do this. The nurse practitioner trained under Dr. Rossi did. She spotted it within five seconds. What was really interesting was that as soon as I, I, as I sat down, the doctor who was like trying to uh, examine my, my scalp, it took like two seconds, five seconds. And she said, this is alopecia areata incognita, like five seconds. So I was five seconds away from an answer for a year, let's say, or for 10 years. And no one told me. And, and, and at that point, my mind was, you know, going everywhere, like was crazy because what my first thought was, if only they, you know, the surgeon would, would have told me the, the day before the transplant, when you apply for a transplant, you go there. The first thing they do is they examine your scalp. I don't remember now the, 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 what's the reason, the main reason, but they do. And they also take some blood, you know, they, they, they do some exams and it was clear to her and it wasn't clear to them, to an equipe of people, you know, that it's just doing this every day to multiple people. I mean, did they know uh, and not told me or they didn't even know? I don't know what's worse, you know, I, I don't know if it's the uh, not knowing or not, not even paying attention. I, I don't know, but that was something that, you know, I... It's something that I keep asking myself. In my eyes, this new diagnosis for Alessandro was sort of like the Occam's razor moment. It's the simplest explanation for why all of his past treatments had failed. Yes, he still has androgenic alopecia, but now he also knows he has this other hair loss disorder, alopecia areata incognita, and that might've been preventing him from achieving results. I said, Rob, you can't believe this. I mean, she, she said this, so it's an autoimmune condition. And we were both happy about it. I mean, we were both like also excited about it, right? So she explained what kind of, you know, uh, thing th th that was. And she just really, you know, it didn't take much for her to give me this corticosteroid. It's this, this like foam. Alopecia areata isn't treated with minoxidil. It's not treated with finasteride. It's treated with corticosteroids. And maybe by incorporating corticosteroids into his routine, perhaps he'll finally turn a corner. So that's exactly what he started to do. He added in a topical corticosteroid once per week, Olux or Clobetasol, to his scalp. And she said, apply this foam once a week, which was weird as a, you know, once a week. I mean, it's, it's isn't that too little? Like once a week, what's go that going to do? I mean, nothing is working with my hair. And she said, yeah, just apply this and keep on applying minoxidil and keep on applying uh, topical finasteride every day. So I was doing once a week, one, let's say, handful like, like this of the corticosteroid called Olux. Once a, once a day, I was using the uh, minoxidil, so one milliliter a day and one milliliter of topical finasteride. So I was doing that. I started applying this and she was right. I mean, uh, they were right. The doctor was was there as well. The, let's say the main guy was there as well. And they told me, yeah, you improved. So we, we, we compared pictures together. And uh, there, was a, there was a bit of disappointing right there because I remember telling you about it by email. And the pictures were, the quality of the picture was not good. And there was, this was January, so four months in. And the picture they took me, they, they took the second picture, uh, say of the second visit, were blurred in a way. They were kind of dark. Uh, and the first pictures were bright. So there was like, yeah, is that improving or is it just what you're telling me? So you had, I had these doubts. And... How could you blame me? I mean, after 10 years of suffering, you're, you kind of, you know, you lose your mind a bit. So you lose also some, you know, trust in people. 
Understandably, Alessandro was a bit skeptical at first. I mean, he hadn't yet noticed any regrowth for himself, and he had a very frustrating treatment history with other dermatologists. But then he had a follow-up appointment booked months later. So perhaps he'd start to notice things by then. And that's actually exactly what happened. It was March, and it was, I went back there. So he said, yeah, come on over, let's take a look. And at that point, that was my happy day. Because when I went back, two more months were uh, passed at the time was like six months in and uh, I, I really noticed the difference. And he, he told me, you, you do not see it because you, you, you're, not, you know, you're, you're not a doctor, but I, I can see it like from here and I'll show you right now. And I really did see a difference. The difference was mainly with the size of the hair, the diameter, the scalp overall looked healthier. And the, the way he took the picture was he split my hair here and part them like this. And I could clearly see the difference between the first time I went there and that time. So there you go. Finally, a decade into fighting hair loss, Alessandro is no longer seeing this progressively worsen. For the first time, he is seeing hair regrowth and it's continuing to regrow. And it's all because he got into the hands of a nurse practitioner and a doctor who actually knew what they were talking about. And because he was willing to evaluate and reevaluate that initial assumption about his case in the face of new data. First, I wanna say that your website is golden. It's amazing because when, when, I, when I got there, it was like, oh my God, this is how it should be done. This is how, people should tackle this because you offer in a really clear, concise and, and really, really well organized way. It's, it's an opportunity, you know, to, for people to, to really, you know, it's a deep dive, you know, they, you, you just go there and you see all these resources and all this data. And I think it's, uh, it's really well done. And it's, it really changed my life uh, because it's uh, losing hair and or suffering from hair loss. It's not just about the hair itself. We all know it's about, you know, your, the way you, you see yourself, the way you appear, the way if you're really young, like I was, you felt like old and it's like, it's, it's, it's really hard, you know. I'm a sensitive type of guy, so it's, it's, it was really tough for me. You really offer some clarity and you really, you really, you know, earn the trust of, of people there because it's, uh, I felt, I felt at home, you know, it's, uh, it's weird to say because we just met on here on, on Zoom or we did, we made calls on, but also the community itself is amazing and people are really helping each other and it's a small community, but it's really valuable. Alessandro today is continuing to see regrowth and he finally has relief in knowing that this problem is no longer getting worse for him. He also wanted to share some words with anybody who decides to watch this video. Two things are really important for people who maybe will watch this for me to, to, to know. And one thing is that if they're looking for a really a, a way uh, uh, to, to cure their uh, hair loss or to improve their situation, your website is uh, the place to start because it's, uh, again, it's so well done and well organized. Yeah, and this world is so full of, you know, the industry itself is full of interests. So every, everybody's pulling you from a, another uh, a direction, right? So you're like in the middle and you're confused and you don't know where to go. So that's why it's really valuable what you do. And uh, I'm so happy we, we met because otherwise I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be as happy as I am today. And don't lose hope. And these things take time. And uh, you, you said it in the website as well. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So just, you know, be patient and keep working on it and uh, maybe you'll find some solution and some, some light at the end of the tunnel. So again, I'm so, I'm so happy we did this and uh, I'm really open for everybody who wants to maybe talk to me or connect with me and uh, please share with everybody my, my, I don't know, my number, my email address, because I'm, I'm really happy to help, not just them, but also what you do. I feel, I, I, I really think is uh, super valuable. When I reflect on Alessandro's story, on the one hand, I am overjoyed. I mean, he had spent so much time, so much energy, 
and the sheer relief that it must feel to finally know that this problem is no longer getting worse. It's finally improving. I find that to be beautiful and moving. I wish that for everybody facing this. And yet I also find myself devastated that he had to go through this in the first place. I mean, why was he misdiagnosed by five different clinicians five separate times? Why didn't any of his doctors know how to make that differential diagnosis? Why didn't they rule this out before giving him a transplant? Why was it that our team, who has no diagnostic capabilities or access to microzoomed photos of Alessandro's scalp, why were we the first to even suspect this? Why weren't his clinicians tracking his treatment responses over the decade and revising recommendations accordingly? Why was Alessandro left for 10 years to figure this out all on his own? That's the kind of stuff that really bothers me because if Alessandro's case were just a one-off, that would be one thing. It's not. It's this lacking standard of care that is far too prevalent and far too common for hair loss sufferers. And it's time that things change. I wish everybody who's fighting hair loss had access to an Alfredo Rossi or a Jeffrey Donovan or a top hair loss clinician. I wish these top tiered dermatologists didn't have months to years long waiting lists. I wish bottom feeder dermatologists would stop selling their hair loss patients into PRP or PRP plus A cell or stem cells or exosomes or any other poorly supported autologous therapy, many of which have shown no benefit over microneedling despite costing 1,000 times more money. I wish popular hair growth brands would stop manipulating the setup of their clinical trials to include participants who will get results from a nutritional supplement, but who won't reflect the average consumer of the product that that company is selling. And I wish dermatologists would stop recommending those products to fill their pockets and at the expense of your hair. So to Alessandro, I thank you for your perseverance and your commitment. To Carlo, I thank you for your incredible support to our community. And to everybody else, I remain hopeful for a better future. For now, you need to stay vigilant, you need to stay educated, you need to be your own patient advocate. And to help you where we can, we've put together a new video and a PDF checklist about how to dominate your next dermatology visit. So if you have been to a dermatologist and felt that they barely looked at your hair or dismissed your health symptoms or didn't really evaluate your hair loss with scrutiny, this is never going to happen again. We have a framework and a list of questions in this video and PDF that you can bring to your dermatology appointment and they cannot answer those questions unless they actually examine your scalp thoroughly with a micro zoomed device like a dermatoscope or a photo trichogram. So use that video, use that framework, use that PDF checklist and hopefully you won't ever need to wait five years for a five second answer that could change everything. Again, most people watching this are not going to face Alessandro's situation. Most people watching this will not have alopecia areata or alopecia areata incognita. For the few that do, I hope this changes things for you. And for those who don't, please still use this framework, the lessons, this video, this checklist to level up on your hair gains. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.